Good morning, good to see you all. Um, I'd love to be here yesterday, but I couldn't because my son, my son was graduating from university, so I, I had to be there. My colleague was here yesterday and I'm here today. And uh, for the last decades, we've been working on telescopes, but then the very, very big ones for astronomical science. So, and the, the largest one we contributed to with the MIRI instrument, the mid-infrared instrument, was James Webb, six and a half meters across. And currently we're building the instrumentation for the extremely large telescope, 40 meters across. And we want them to be large, to be looking at faint objects and to make a very sharp image. And I hope this is the clicker. We already have the technology to make very small telescopes for decades. We just couldn't figure out that anyone would be interested in a very small telescope that fits in a single piece of glass. Until we made a video, a YouTube video about it, and suddenly we had two million views and 10,000 comments, I want one. And we thought, oh, there might be a market there. So we started a spin-off company called Tiny Telescopes, tiny telescope making these small telescopes for many different applications, as I'll show you later. First, I'll tell you how it works. Oh, okay. So the animation has gone, sorry for that. Light enters the telescope from the left. The first surface is a transmission surface. Then the second surface at the back is a reflection surface. Does this work? Hardly. And the light is collected at the center of the front where it's reflected again. And then at the back exit is a field flattener that makes sure that you have a flat focal plane where you put your detector, your CCD, your CMOS. And in this one piece of glass, all the functionalities there, including the baffles, the only problem that we have, if you compress it to the size that we do, all the four optical surfaces become extremely aspheric, which means very hard to make. And to make it even more complicated, we use it in reflection, in immersion, inside the glass. And therefore, the accuracy of those surfaces has to be six times more accurate than the industry standard. And that's why, up to now, we don't know of anyone else who succeeded in making one. Because it's very difficult. But once you have accomplished this, there's um, tremendous benefits. So we make this of fusilica, which is a radiation hard, very low thermal expansion material that's transparent from the ultraviolet to the, um, to the shortwave infrared, to microns or even more. We guarantee that it's diffraction limited. Um, it's extremely robust against radiation, shocks, vibration. Um, there's no alignment and no drift since it's a single component. Uh, no spider holding the secondary mirror that you would normally have in telescopes that give you diffraction spiders. Uh, it's so small and light that you can take it anywhere, and by anywhere, I mean really anywhere. I mean, we're talking with ESA to bring this to Enceladus and to land it on that moon at Saturn. Um, the coatings, uh, especially the reflective coatings, are, are reflecting from the inside of the glass, so there cannot be any dust or contamination built on top of that. And since it's only one component, there's very little failure modes, and you can reduce a lot of the testing involved, especially for satellites, and that makes it very cost-effective. So let me give you some examples. Um, and we do have them also downstairs at this place. So this is this sample. Um, it's about 30 grams, 25 millimeter, um, op uh, uh, optical aperture. So on the top left you see a normal field of view of what your camera or your phone would see or a 50 millimeter lens on a DSLR. And you can just barely make out in the distance this sign, but you can definitely not read what's on it. And the square that you see over there is the field of view of the tiny telescope, which is the big picture where you can clearly see what's written there at one and a half kilometer distance. And this is a little bit closer by at 125 meter distance where you can barely make out a human being climbing that wall, but with a tiny telescope, you can see the details of the shoe. 
translating that to in orbit. It means that at 500 kilometers orbit, with this single piece, you can get 10 meter ground resolution. But that's not all. I mean, this is this very small variety. We have one that's ex uh, tailor-made, I would say, for pocket cubes. It's a 40 millimeter diameter, 240 millimeter focal length uh, telescope that just fits in, well, one tiny bit of only 43 millimeter length, I recall. It's this one, we have it on display as well. Over here, there's a live demo downstairs, so please come and see this. This size is five by five centimeters as outer diameter, so it fits a pocket cube. And what it does, it gives you the field of view of your thumbnail at arm's length. And you can barely see a mast over there, a broadcasting mast, at a little over one kilometer distance. And this is the difference what you would see with, let's say, a very good phone in very good zoom mode. This is your DSLR picture with a good 200 millimeter lens. And this is the tiny telescope uh, image. Um, going closer than one kilometer, you can really see the difference between the DSLR and the tiny telescope where you can see the individual, in this case, the connections of the, um, of the cables to this antenna. Translating this to space, now first, I borrowed some images from uh, Albert Obertol. Um, and there, actually, there were some different specifications, but in the same size, uh, where I believe it was a 70 millimeter uh, focal length camera, we now can fit a 240 millimeter length focal camera. Um, so in space, what this would be able to do, from 450 kilometers altitude, you would see the entire port of Rotterdam, which is 20 by 20 kilometers, at a resolution of five meters. And I'm not sure if the screen will, will give this to you, but this essentially means that you see every single rubber boat that's there. Um, we have created the simulator. Um, we're trying to get it on our website, but um, it's not yet. So um, uh, I can do simulations for you for the wavelengths that you require. So this says the altitude and at 450 kilometers distance with the pixel size that we have over here, we have five meters ground resolution. And this matches what the performance in the blue end of the spectrum is. For the red end of the spectrum and especially in the infrared, the performance is worse by the nature of light. Applications, I've covered Earth observation cameras uh, from space, but this also has applications in laser SETCOM, where we have to send signals and receive signals from other satellites. If you put this on a star tracker versus a regular camera, you can get five times the precision uh, without having really large and really expensive star trackers. Uh, obviously, you can put this on drones where you cannot take a long telescope, but now you can have the same performance, surveillance, and my dream is that eventually there will be a fourth camera on all of your cell phones that everybody has super binoculars in their pockets. Um, these cameras cost 10 euros or 10 dollars, maybe even 10 pounds a piece, um, which is five dollars for the lens, five dollars for the sensor electronics and focusing, and at the volumes, we can even match that price because the technology is not much different. The thing is, we cannot make a hundred million of those devices a year yet. It will probably take five to 10 years before we can because we are currently scaling up from the prototype phase to series production. Um, just by chance, We've put this in, in and you'll see downstairs, we put uh, this in, 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 and we observed some uh, nearby objects like this goose. And then when you, so the entire field of view can be seen here. Not, yeah, you can see. So from that feather, you can see the individual tiny feather resolutions. So it's, it even is a 
long distance microscope at the same time. Maybe not of interest to you guys, but this was a surprise and now there's all kinds of medical applications as well. For instance, if you are in an MRI, you cannot have equipment there because of the magnetic fields, but you want to see details. Um, this is sh to show that we really are now in the series production. We're building a, si a series of 50 of those and the smaller ones. And this is the next generation, 60 millimeter diameter optical aperture uh, that we're building, uh, but that's still in the prototype phase. All right, I'll conclude with our vision, mission, and values. So what we want to do is to give you the best, um, the best imaging capabilities that you can have for your size of satellite, whether it be a big satellite, a CubeSat, or a pocket cube. Uh, please come and talk to us, and we'll match and see what, you, uh, what we can do for you. Thank you so much.